Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Constantinople, a Bessemer Operating Advisor. And for those of you who don't know me, I help facilitate the amazing go-to-market community here at Bessemer. Um, you might also have crossed paths with me. Um, I was uh, ran an um, agency called Outcast um, for about 10 years and was most recently the CMO of Sundesk. Uh, and prior to that, I had a bunch of fun jobs um, uh, in the media side on in comms and marketing. Um, I am really happy to be here. We've pulled together a really great group for you. Um, I'd love to, to give you all a warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. So our topic is cutting through the noise, PR fundamentals for founders. And it's great to have so many startup founders and operators in the audience, as well as, as comms folks and, and some marketing folks. So thank you for joining today. Um, as many of you may know, Bessemer launched uh, their go-to-market course for entrepreneurs. And in it, we share best practices and insights to help startup leaders position their business, um, gain traction, build engines necessary to drive your SaaS revenue. Um, and if you are RSVP to this event, you'll be signed up to get free access to a special uh, go-to-market course we put together. Um, so if you have a friend or founder you think would benefit from this course, be sure to send them this link. Uh, I think it's up on your screen right now. And as a foundation in this course, uh, I also share a framework on how to build your brand communication strategy. Plug. Um, so this is a great uh, starting point when it comes to developing your company's mission, vision, values, as well as your business positioning statement and key messages. Um, many people say that being a good storyteller is the number one job that you have as a founder. It impacts how you connect with your customers, teams, investors, and of course the media. Uh, and I've always had a phrase I've used um, and I've a hundred times over the past year, especially, I've, I've been sharing it with folks on the story makes the market. So how you message and connect with your audiences really drives traction, shapes your reputation, determines your business future, and especially in all the crazy we've all been going through um, the last few years, you could say, but certainly in the last year, um, this is more now more important than ever to really own it as best you can. So that's the inspiration behind today's conversation. Um, we wanted to share PR fundamentals with, with you all that you need to know as you're ramping toward really significant milestones and how to cut through a very noisy market. So to that end, it's my absolute pleasure um, to introduce you to our three fantastic experts who are gonna join me today. And we purposely are gonna do some Q&A up front, but really left some a bunch of time at the end for questions and to make this really interactive. So um, please know that we'll make sure to shut ourselves up and throw it back over to you guys so you can ask whatever you want. So um, to kick it off, um, I would love for the panelists and they're gonna introduce themselves first, of course, um, but to also share what you think is an absolute non-negotiable requirement for before a founder starts talking to the media. So let's start with the other Alex, Alex Wilhelm um, from TechCrunch. So thrilled to have you on and thanks for your time. Uh, and how do you want us to, how would you like to answer this and start us off? Well, hi everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Alex. I'm on the equity podcast over at TechCrunch. I write our morning newsletter. I've been assigned a daily video. I just, I do a lot of different things over there. Um, I've known Bessemer forever, so it's great to be part of this. Uh, my non-negotiable, I think, is fully audited gap financials that are then shared with me in uh, great detail. <laughs> so that way I can really get to the nitty gritty of how a company is doing. Uh, no, I, I would say the thing that I care about the most is a willingness to to share. Um, I think we'll get into this later, but often you talk to people and they don't really want to talk about what they're building. They want to tell you this one tiny thing and nothing else about what they're doing. And that tends to lead to pretty flat conversations um, and kind of wasted time on everyone's side. So I would say just like an excitement to actually talk about what they're building and how it's going would be my uh, number one general thing. Great. Thank you. Kelly. Hi there. I'm Kelly Ferguson. I'm the Senior Director of Communications at Clarity, which is a cybersecurity company. Uh, we're focused on protecting cyber physical systems in critical infrastructure. Uh, Bessemer is, is one of our investors. Um, so it's been great to have their support as well. Um, and before Clarity, I was at a PR agency for many years. Um, so I've been in this space for a while. Um, my absolute non-negotiable requirement before talking to the media, I would say is figure out your messaging. What's, what's the hook? What's the narrative? What's 
unique about your journey and your story that is going to make you stand out and make you make others want to learn more about what you're building. Um, there's many other steps that should happen as well, but that would be, you know, the first place that you should start from my point of view. Great. Thank you. And John. Hello, uh, I'm John O'Brien. I uh, am the founder of SPS comms. We've been around for about seven years. Um, we work with mostly uh, technology companies across, you know, AI and, and fintech and uh, enterprise software and even asteroid mining. Um, prior to SPS, I spent eight years at the Outcast Agency working under a horrible tyrant. Um, just kidding. <laughs> Alex uh, is the best. And um, yeah, my non-negotiable is actually where this uh, where this started is is. Uh, the separation of go-to-market messaging and press messaging. And it's not that those two things live in conflict. Go-to-market messaging is really, really important, but it's not your story, right? I always tell executives, like, don't sit down with a journalist. And if they ask you, who are you or what your company does, don't just start with like a, we have built a platform to do X, right? Everyone starts a company for a reason. And that reason is really interesting. You saw product market fit. You saw TAM that nobody else saw in a certain industry. You, you know, there was something missing that, and, and you're filling the gap. And so that's the story. And then the go-to-market messaging is kind of the table stakes, like clarity of like, this is what we built and who we built it for. But everything around that makes you more interesting. Love it. Thank you. All right, cool. So let's um, thank you for your intros and the initial thoughts and let's get going. Um, so I obviously I kind of don't need to paint the picture of startup PR. I'm sure you're all living it and feel it every day. And we're sort of aware that it, the, the pitching part and the getting your stories um, out there and, and sort of landing the way that you envision or need for your business to grow. Um, it's rough, right? It's, I'm sure a lot of you are just going, uh, you know, what's the secret sauce? And there really isn't one these days, but we're going to try to get to some really good tips and, and trips, uh, tips and tricks. Um, so it's super crowded. Everyone's coming at Alex, poor Alex, which is why we want him to sort of share what, what sort of, what gets by and what makes him interested in something. Um, so I would, I would love Alex, if you could just share sort of with all the noise, we were just talking before we went on of just how crazy your day is and how much you're ex excited but overwhelmed sort of in the AI space right now. Everything is coming at you a thousand miles an hour and you're learning so much, which again is incredibly inspiring and interesting, but also you only have a certain amount of time of the day and space to write. So give me, uh, give us a sense of sort of how you're rolling these days and what it's like for you. Before I do that, I want to say I have some slight right eye irritation. So if you see me pawing at the side of my face, um, I'm not losing my That's mind. Not a it's signal just... to me to shut the hell up. Okay, good. No, no, it's just <laughs> uh, it's been happening all day. Who knows why? It could be the baby. It could be stress. Okay. But if I look slightly strange, that's that's what's going on. Okay, I promise, I'm sane. To, um, to answer your question, to me, there's more competing stuff happening in the tech world right now than I recall a few years past. And that seems to be drowning out or eating some of the space that might have been reserved before for startups. And I don't know if you want to just put this on the shoulders of kind of the AI craze we've seen for the last 18, 24 months, but it, it does seem that big tech companies are doing so much that there's just less room for startups to kind of raise their hand and become part of the overall conversation. So that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind. The other thing is a, a bit of a sad point, but um, the world of media has been healthier in the past and there are fewer of us than I think there have been for some time, if not ever. And so there are more total people out there uh, reaching out to try to catch our eye than I recall ever seeing before. So not only are you know, Alphabet and, and Microsoft and Apple stealing, I think, some of the oxygen. Um, there's just not that many of us left to to talk to people. Um, and then the other thing I'll throw in there is just because of the economics of media, the pressure to be quick and reactive is, I think, the worst has ever been in my experience. And so to take time to sit down with founders and so forth is uh, increasingly precious. And so it's, it's kind of um, a trifecta of things that I think make it tough for everyone out there who's with us today, who's building something that they're really excited about to honestly get on my calendar. And as a response to that, I haven't really read email in the last like 
five years, um, which helps some, but it's not a com- kind of a panacea to, you know, all the issues of, of inbound. But yeah, I think that's a, that's an overview of how it feels. Everything's really cool. I just only have two hands. So what, so what does, what are those elements then of something really good where you're like, I'm absolutely going to either drop everything or make time for that. Like what makes a good tech story pitch for you? When I said uh, audited gap financials, I was only like 80% kidding. Um, <laughs> when someone comes to me and says, hey, our ARR grew 100% in the last quarter, and now we're at you know three and a half million ARR and we're gonna go out and raise our series A extension or whatever, that tells me that that person is willing to talk hard details, to dig into the nitty gritty, and to actually answer questions about the business itself. I think that sometimes founders can get a little bit more focused on trying to craft what appears to be the perfect narrative or to storytell in the way that they're often guided to. When in reality, at the very base level, I work for a business publication. And so business results are the thing that is the most important thing to me. Having a cool founding story, awesome. Having a cool pedigree, cool. Having worked at another cool company, all right. Uh, Having investors that I know, sure. But if you tell me that your business is going from one to 10 to a thousand, and you're willing to talk about that, then I literally can't not talk to you. Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, let's for a second just switch sort of gears on if you're the company, you've gotten, you've made your seed or series A, um, you maybe been covered in TechCrunch for that um, and other business press. Uh, and it's, you've signaled there, you have traction. So yay for you. Um, and then the comms folks in the room, there's so much that leads up to an, an outcome like that for landing and getting you to write. So John, on the other side, what you see so much uh, and a very wide variety of size company, tech companies, et cetera, ramping toward these milestones. So how are you sort of, what's your winning formula in the background? Um, that then lands you and you, you know, an Alex uh, byline. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the the main thing is, and it kind of bleeds into my, to my non-negotiable, but it's like, you know, really become a good storyteller and, and to just be really pointed about it. Don't sell your product or service, right? Like pitching a journalist and saying, well, we have built this and this is what we're going to do kind of thing. They get 500 of those a day. Right. So I'll take, uh, I'll give you an example. So we represent, a company called Light Matter that does photonic computing. So I could send a pitch to Alex and say, hey, you know, this company is building a photonic compute system that's going to move data 10 times faster and, you know, whatever. He probably has six of those in his inbox. But if I lead with, you know, hey, do you realize like by the end of the decade that 10% of the world's total power will be pointed to AI inference unless something else happens? Did you know that the latest AI chips have a heat density similar to that of a nuclear reactor. Like there's a PhD from MIT that's working on this problem, right? Like that's a more interesting conversation that has tension, that has like, you know, implications that brings in NVIDIA and OpenAI and, you know, all the, all the companies that are hot right now. And so, you know, that's what we want to start with. We always talk to our clients about advocate for the problem that you're solving before you get to it, right? And if you articulate the problem you're solving, Within that, you are articulating the TAM of, of, of what you're building and, and what's possible. And then by the time you even get to, okay, so what we have built is X, they already know, right? And so the whole conversation un, unfolds in this very um, clear way. And then again, it, like when you're pointing out all these other uh, problems in the industry, you become a resource for that journalist ongoing, right? So it's not just about this like, you know, we have a thing, do you want to write about it? Yes or no sort of relationship. It's more, let's sit down, let's talk. And, you know, at the end of the the uh, uh, conversation, if, if a journalist is like, hey man, can I get your cell phone number or something, right? That that freaks a lot of PR people out. I'm like, that's great. That's mm-hmm. a victory. Good job, right? So, so John, hey. not, not to criticize, but I did just do a search of photonic computing in my inbox and not that many options actually. So apparently that's a really good one. People oh. should use that more often. I got one coming your way, man. (laughs) Winning. That's why John said yes to this. Um, So to that end, obviously, we're a bunch of control freaks. At least I like to think uh, I am. I think I know you enough to know you are. Um, so, So the hard thing about this is there's so much, there's some things in your control, and then there's a ton that that aren't, you know, that's not. So 
for founders, what is, again, this is earned press, so you have to pitch and win <laughs> uh, their attention and their space, but what what is in your controls, you know, so that you can put together your best feet forward? Obviously, you were just talking about sort of the story. Oh, sorry, is that for me? Yeah, yeah, well, it's, it's just oh, a yeah. follow-up to that. It's sort of like, yes. What are the, what's that checklist of like two or three things that you make sure other than sort of the lead, which you just talked about, right? Like here's how to sort of uh, get their attention, but what mm -hmm. else do you feel like is in their control when you're working with a company? Um, does that I think, I think, yeah, I, I think, um, well, what's, I mean, what's this, in their control? I mean, this, I think I'm getting, trying to get to like, it goes to the point where there's youth, a lot of companies I feel like who haven't maybe necessarily dealt with the press before, you think you can kind of go through and literally control everything once you do the pitch and yes. how it turns out and the story and everything else. Yes. So if you can just talk maybe a better frame is sort of like what what it is that you can control and really where you have to step up and just say, that it, you know, we've done our part and it will be what it's been. You have to kind of give up your control. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. And, and frankly, like we've had... Uh, uh, situations where we'll we'll do a briefing with with a journalist and then the, and then a client will say like can I see the story before it's published or you know want to change the headline and I'm like I, I honestly I guess I've been doing this too long that I forget to even set that expectation yeah. <laughs> up front because it's like most <laughs> people don't don't um, think that way but you know when you're dealing with startups and founders that have never done this before it's 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 a fair question on their side but from our side it's like oh god you know like we need to we need to have a conversation um, and so they they need to get comfortable uh, with the fact that, again, like, you know, uh, the end result of any story is going to be a bit of your agenda, the reporter's point of view, the editor's two cents, and, you know, maybe, a, uh, you know, a snarky headline or, you know, something like that, If definitely if you're dealing with the register. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so okay. we, we uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, no, that's great. Thank you. Sorry. Can um, I jump in yeah, this really quick? Yeah. Yeah. The way that I the way that I deal with this is if you're a seed stage founder, I have no expectations of like press literacy. Um, but by the time you're like, yeah. you've got like a hundred employees, you should have your shit together. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think there's probably some very slight um, willingness to be patient with people mm -hmm. who are brand new because those are the people, frankly, that are the most fun to talk to because they're still super excited. They're not jaded. They just want to vamp. And so if someone blurts something out. And they have, you know, one employee, four dollars and half a product. I'm going to be much more willing to be like, we can just put that over there for now, yeah. you know. Um, but I think definitely that that goes away as a company gets older and more sophisticated, and people get more more trained. Great. Okay. Cool. Thank you, um, Kelly. I have a question for you, which is yes. uh, your your inside, um, and you're building your you know ceo and company reputation right now and it really starts early obviously so how should a ceo think about hiring you <laughs> hiring a PR role and sort of what's the right approach and timing how, how would from your experience um i i know it's different for everybody but what could, not only timing but sort of what creates that healthy relationship and really good model where you're in there with them and they really trust you as a strategic partner yeah um I mean, like you said, there's no single way to do it, but at least in my experience, um, in the early days, it's pretty common for either the head of marketing and sometimes even the founders themselves to be working directly with a PR agency or um, you know, some, side of, some sort of outside help that's not an in-house role like what I have currently. Um, I joined Clarity as like the first in-house comms person when I think we were between our series C and D rounds. I think we were maybe between 100 and 150 employees total. So just for, you know, larger context of where the business is at, that's when, um, you know, we created an in-house comms role. Um, so, you know, that might be a good uh, benchmark. Um, but I think it's also, you know, it's, it's dependent on, you know, what's the maturity of the marketing team and, you know, what is the maturity, like is, is, the, is the head of marketing does, do they come from a comms background? Like, do they have the chops and do they have the bandwidth to work with the PR agency or work directly with, with the press to, you know, to, to handle everything that comes with it? Um, so that's kind of, and, and, and I think that's also, you know, when a company reaches that level of maturity, that's also when a comms person like myself has enough to work with yeah. in order to, you know, 
run a program and that's not just based on funding rounds, but also all of the stuff that happens in between. Um, so that sort of has been my experience. Um, in terms of what contributes to a healthy working model, um, I would say, right, always bring in the comms person earlier than you think you should. Um, you know, if, if you've got something that you want to make noise out of, or you're not sure whether it's, if there's anything there, it's, you know, it's better to get the comms people involved sooner rather than later um, in order for it to be the most effective. Um, I would also say find an agency, if, you know, if, if that's the, the model that you go with, find an agency that you can treat like a true business partner as opposed to just another vendor. Um, you know, in the world of PR and media, it's all about relationships and um, that can really make or break the success of the program overall. That's a great one. Um, something you mentioned, and John, I'm sure you have experienced this too, that just made me think about sort of the founders sometimes think it's sort of like you, you just or we don't need a team or we don't need X. We just because we just have sort of this one announcement we want to make. And then we have another announcement in six months. So like, why would I have anybody? You know, we don't I don't need anybody except for those points in time. But really, this notion that we used to call it outcast rolling thunder, and it's not just outcast, I'm sure it's a term other places, but you have sort of your moments that you might have mapped, you know, product releases, um, funding announcements, um, executive shift, whatever it is. Um, but you need to keep this sort of rolling thunder going and momentum going in between. And that's really hard to do, but it can be done and planned for. So John and, and Kelly both, sort of how, how have you thought about that or coached um, CEOs and product teams and marketing teams um, to think about that? Yeah, I mean, frankly, we've actually tried to do away with the sort of comms plan of going launch by launch. Yeah. And, and, and that takes a little bit of education. And sometimes it's even like really mature companies that come to us and are like, oh, like we hadn't really you know, considered that. And so, we, you know, we talk about doing more, you know, broader thought leadership campaigns, and then those news announcements are kind of woven in throughout. I think for, you know, really early stage startups, um, it, it, you know, you may not have a whole lot, or you need to focus on building and things like that. Um, but you can't always control your own timeline, meaning, you know, we're living in a more hyper competitive world, right? So especially in the world of AI, it's like, well, if you think you can dictate your own comms timeline, you can until a competitor comes out and leapfrogs you, right? Mm -hmm. And so you always need to be kind of, you know, I think, thinking about it, it should be part of kind of every week's discussions of like, are there things we can be doing? Or if this happens in the competitive market, how are we going to respond? Because you don't want to be caught you know, getting leapfrogged and then have have no plan or, you know, have just fired the freelancer you used for one month uh, and, and now they're booked up. Right. Because it takes time to also get to know the company and, and, and understand right. where to find things. Um, Kelly, anything? Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I would just say that the rolling thunder can be, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's almost where all the magic happens, if you will. Like that's what makes a, a PR program are worth doing in the first place. Um, and building relationships and getting your story out there and, you know, any kind of brand awareness initiative is usually a long game. You can't, it's not singular moments in time. It's, it's, you, there needs to be some level of consistency over a long period of time. And so I've always been, you know, of the mind that if you're gonna take the time to invest in PR, you need to look at, look at it as a long-term thing, not singular moments in time, because it's not gonna be it. You're, you're not gonna have the same impact if, if you treat it like that. Yeah, and a key to me always on this was just being incredibly externally focused. I find a lot of um, your earlier stage companies, you, you're so deep in it and so, um, which you should be, and uh, you've got sort of a, sometimes tunnel vision into what's happening with you and your, company and sometimes competitors, but really like how, what are um, trends and themes you can jump onto uh, as well, uh, sort of trend jack, if, if you will, um, and be looking for those opportunities and reading so much and consuming so that you can also then pinpoint who's going to care about, you know, your issue or thought leadership that you might have that's broader than just like, I'm selling you this thing and this announcement we have today. So um, 
to that end on sort of founder led comms, I just wanted to touch base a minute and then I, Alex, I have a, a question for you too on this, but sort of it's super popular right now. I think it, you know, and it always has been for, if, again, to your point, Alex, on, um, you know, your four people and the CEOs, you know, good and saying, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to push this and try to get in front of all these reporters and is working it. Um, but the CEO sort of taking a lead directly with the media and sharing communications on social and sort of not using traditional sort of strategic uh, or, or tech PR as it were, you know, do you think that this works? Do you recommend this? Is there a time where you should shift or if the person's really good at this? Because we all know founders who are really savvy at this. I mean, John and I both worked with Aaron Levy in early days at Fox. Like he was awesome at this, but he also had a full team that he listened to, but he was really good on his own. So do you do you ever recommend it? To, this is to both John and Kelly and, you know, can it be successful? And then where does it break down and you kind of have to pull it back? Yeah. I can start. Um, I... Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's been uh, a, a lot of buzz on this uh, lately in the comms world and, and Lulu's uh, manifesto last week and, and things like that. And I, I do think there is a lot of um, good things that can come from like, you know, trying to push the envelope in in going direct with, you know, with with founders. However, I also think that, frankly, it, it, I think it's only going to work for like very high profile founders or very buzzy companies. Um, I, it, it's... I, I think it's really hard for uh, a founder and a company with, with very little profile to just, you know, go direct and, and do their own comms and expect that, um, you know, it's going to amplify press and sales and, 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 um, and their brand. And so um, I think it's, it's where some people are mistaking an ingredient for a recipe a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um uh, when you have a founder that is willing to invest the time and is really dynamic in their sort of takes on current events and, and things like that, it's it's a full go, like absolutely 100% yes. But I also work with founders of even like publicly traded companies who are, you know, really good at this at times. But like, if I came to them with like a, you know, eight page plan of like how we're going to like amplify, you know, they're going to be like, go away. Or like, I don't want to spend this much time you know, doing it. I just want to tweet when I want to tweet. Um, and so it really, it really takes buy-in from the very beginning, but I do think um, it could be, it, it, it can be a really powerful uh, avenue. Kelly, before we get to you, just we, for those of you, for those folks who have not followed the Lula Manifesto, we just give a quick background on that. You mentioned John, the manifesto. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, she, she came out and, and Lulu was at uh, Activision. She's, she's kind of a famous uh, person in, in the comms world and, and super smart and, and great. Um, and her manifesto, it was just kind of like, you know, traditional PR is dead and everything is, is, is go, go direct now. Um, and I agreed with a lot of it, but I, I don't agree with, with some of it. Thanks. Kelly, any thoughts on this before we move on? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously I am biased towards involving comms pros in comms related activities as much as possible. Um, but that said, I agree with John, there's, there's definitely situations that call for it and where it can work to your advantage. Um, I mean, in terms of being accessible to media, like, you know, if Alex is working on a story and he needs a comment from somebody that day, having to go through all the appropriate channels versus being able to call somebody up casually that can make the difference between being in the story or not. Um, so, you know, when that's the situation, like as the comps person, I'm like, I don't want to get in the way, like, let me help you behind the scenes. Um, but you know, let, let's make this easy for people. Um, and that could be, you know, that's, that's a great way to build a relationship over time. Um, and same with, you know, social media posts are, typically going to get more engagement and be more effective when they come from a real person as opposed to a corporate handle, for example. So I'm all for direct in those types of situations. Um, but even when that is the method, I, I do think a comms person should, you know, be having input and, help, and helping out behind the scenes. Um, you know, there's certain nuances to how you position things that you may not think about and, and things like that. And just, I, I think it's important to see, you know, the comms, function is not your enemy in this in these situations you can still um you know work as a team while also going direct great can i jump in yes please Alex. so yeah the the aaron levy comment from before really 
jogged my brain because I recall uh, way back in the day when uh, Box bought a company called Crocodoc. This is back in the ancient, ancient past. Um, I was actually at Box's headquarters for um, a meeting uh, with Levy and some other reporters. And as I was leaving, my phone died. I was stranded in their building lobby with like no phone, no Uber. I think it was raining. It was just one of those really crappy moments. And you're like, fuck, am I going to walk all the way across the city just to get home? Uh, and so I like talked my way back upstairs into the box's office and I ended up borrowing Aaron Levy's laptop to charge my phone while sitting with him in a little phone booth while he was working. And he didn't care because he just wanted me to be able to charge my phone so I could leave. And that was that. But you remember little bits of like actual human generosity and they stick out in your brain. Um, and just throw one more founder led uh, example into this. Yeah. Uh, Bob from we Weviate, I forget how to pronounce that. They do vector search or something or other. Um, spent a couple of hours just sitting down with me and explaining what the mm -hmm. hell vector search is, why it matters in AI. And I just learned a lot. And so there are just moments when people that have a high level of knowledge and charisma can put those things together. I just think often people don't have both. It's a pretty rare combination out there in the world, period. Um, but I can see why in certain cases you'd want to lead with founder-led comms versus in other cases you want to take your CEO and put them under a blanket and not let them out. Yeah. Um, so I think high charisma is probably the, the, the X factor here. Yeah. Um, our, and technical founders is, can be a struggle sometimes too, but I do feel like the whiteboard we used to do great. We sort of like let them do what they do best, explain the technology and, and get up and do whiteboard sessions for reporters and just really walk them through and educate them even about sort of here's what the competitors are doing. I mean, there's so many ways to get at this. I feel like we're, um, yeah. So anywho, moving on. Yeah, go ahead, John. Sorry, I, I had one point on that is is uh, what's interesting about what Aaron did, and I think he was a little bit ahead of his time, is is he, you know, he was doing that. But also, if you notice, like less than like 5% of his tweets are ever about Box, right? So yeah. he was just more about like engaging. So it wasn't just about being the leader of Box, but being like a leader in in the technology world. And, and, and uh, I think that's really important when you're doing founder-led comms that people have to see you a little bit, right? It can't just be all just shilling your own company and and uh, promoting yourself. Yeah, no, he, I, I mean, I still use him. I mean, I, it's been a while, Crocodile, but I still use him as a really great shining example of someone who really understood it. And it was, and he did a lot of the work himself. It does take investment and resources if you're a founder or the, and the CEO. I mean, it's, it's definitely a part of your day. And in, he was naturally very good at it and interested in it. So I know that's not for everybody, but I do think that it was a winning formula for, for him, for sure. Um, okay, Alex. So speaking of social, um, sort of when you're following CEOs online, can you share a few that you think are sort of good at this and who have who you sort of love to follow and, and why? And is this is this important? Sort of the, the integrated approach where someone's, you know, do you follow their blog? Do you you know, follow them on social and you sort of actively engage with them. Anyone that stands out to you that you would recommend as a good example or a shitty well, one? Well, let's not. This is a friendly family <laughs> dinner table that's, gathering. Let's not. Fish. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I think makes someone good at that is how different their individual profile is from their corporate handle. Like we mentioned how you, how Levy only tweeted some about box. He did. You could tell he was box first, but he had thoughts and opinions about so many other things. And that's why his handle, which I know it's just at Levy because I've tweeted with him so much over the years. It, it just, you could always tell it was not written by the same person who did the box account. And I think that is a good kind of rubric to tell how well you might be doing as an individual. Uh, to answer your, your, your question about who doesn't do a good job, there is uh, a, a, a number of louder voices out there in the market today, um, sometimes a bit more combative. And I think that uh, a negative example um, and a positive example just has to be Elon, yeah. because occasionally he'll tweet about an upcoming SpaceX launch, and then I will open YouTube and I will watch it live. And then his next tweet is about the Great Replacement Theory and how Democrats are trying to do world government or some shit. And that's less helpful, I think, to his overall business um, business climate. So I think if I had to pick an example, both positive and negative, I'd say him because brilliant at getting attention onto what he does and, and also brilliant at putting both feet in his mouth and then trying to shout. Um, yeah, it's so it's kind of a maddening person to have around because half the time you want to slap him and half the time you want to hug him. I know. It's the old, you know, is all the press good press? Which is, no. I still no. hear people say that and I'm like, oh God, you've never gone through a bad cycle then, you know? 
And Ask really, Bernie Madoff. You right, know? So damaging to your brand. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Um, right before we go to your questions, so we'll be getting those ready. Hopefully you have some. Um, but before we turn it over to the audience, um, Alex, this comes up all the time. And I thought it would be good to just, uh, again, reiterate uh, the difference between on the record, ah, yes. off the record, and on background. And do you ever let CEOs, let's say they put, the, let's, let's say Elon, you're Elon's person, and he's said something to you that you just, we have to pull it back and retract. Do you ever allow that? No um, mercy for billionaires. Yeah. Ground rules. <laughs> Okay. No, no tier. If you own a yacht that's more than three hundred feet, fuck <laughs> you. I don't care. Okay. All righty then. Okay. So your definitions of things. Let's start there. So first of all, on the record is we're talking. I can say Alex Constantinople said that Elon Musk is the most handsome man in the universe and should become supreme lizard lord of all the galaxy. Fair enough. I can literally quote that directly. I will attribute it to your name. On the record, it's just literally what you say is fair game. Period. Off the record is a combination of agreements. Like for example, Alex could say, can we go off the record? And then I would say, yes, Alex, let's do that. And then whatever we talk about after that is not usable, not attributable, completely and utterly memory hold. Except we will remember it, but we can't use it anywhere. And then when we want to go back on the record, we will say back on the record and I'll go, cool. Clarity and agreement are the ways to handle off the record material. It has to be mutually agreed upon to end and start and just be careful with that. Uh, background is tricky. Everyone has a slightly different definition of it. So I would recommend everybody when you're going to speak on background, discuss what that means. Um, people have different phrases like deep background, which would be, I can tell you something, but you can't say that it came from me. Perhaps it might be attributed to source familiar with, et cetera. So I would say, you know, if you're going to speak on background, it does require, I think, a little bit of just conversation and trust. And yeah. so I think every case there is going to be a little bit different. Um, but really, it's it's the middle ground between on and off the record. Okay. Does that cool. answer the question? Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, again, okay. I feel like it's always just reiterated every time so that they're super clear. I mean, to me, whenever there's trouble, it's because everyone made assumptions. And so just being incredibly clear yes. and making sure you're on the same page. The, the only nuance I throw in there is that if you know someone really well, you may develop a bit of shorthand with them. Yeah. And yeah. that is reasonable, but that comes with a relationship, trust and time. And I would not recommend that without someone that you would have lunch with. Yeah, fair. All right. We are getting to the questions and they're rolling in. So I'm gonna start um, with, uh, I, I basically, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, most of them are anonymous. So anyway, if, if not, I'll mention the person's name if that's cool with you. Otherwise, um, uh, just it's a person out there on the call. So, okay, here's one. If you're, if you're not working with a PR firm yet, what's the best way to start contacting journalists or building that network? Well, Alex, I'll start with you and then maybe go to, to John and Kelly too. Well, I feel like this is one of those times in which I should just say that I'm not particularly normal. Um, <laughs> and I'm abnormal in ways that are frustrating, not good. I'm not trying to say that I'm better. I'm saying that I'm worse. Uh, most people in the world of business and media are pretty good at email, which is why I think we all kind of default to it. Um, I don't, which means that I'm just harder to get a hold of than most people. And so I don't think that I'm a particularly good um, answerer of this question, if that makes sense, Alex. So yeah. I, I, I don't want to state my preferences and then have people um, lean on them for other people because I'm kind of a weirdo. Okay. John and Kelly, anything you've seen that breaks through? Asking them first, what's the best way? Not just sending random emails. Like, what have you seen that's kind of worked to break through? Yeah, I mean, I think that authentic approach of like, hey, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here <laughs> kind of thing could work. But I also think like, you know, if, if you're in that situation, try and find someone, right? Uh, you know, everyone knows someone who knows someone who, you know, like who will take a phone call. Like I give out free advice all the time uh, to people who who are looking for it. And so, um, you know, first try and find maybe a resource and just ask a few, a few questions. And then, um, you know, when it comes to actually writing, like understand that there is kind of like a you know, a style and a tone that, that people want to see, you know, if it's overly formal, if it's really long, um, you know, that doesn't really make a good media pitch. Um, but I do think it would be, you know, fairly endearing, I think, or Alex, you can correct me if not, but if somebody was like, hey, I'm a founder of this company, I 
you know, this is my first time ever reaching out to press, but, you know, would love your perspective on this. W you know, would you mind setting up a phone call or, you know, something, right? Like if you just start the conversation rather than, you know, bury them in, in words that come down to a yes, no, will you write a story? It's, it's going to be a lot easier. Yeah. Big endorse about that. Well, and, and again, from where I sit, just myself, I'm an enormous softy. So if you come to me and you're like, Hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll be like, let me help you. <laughs> um, but again, that's because <laughs> I'm essentially made of marshmallow. So that won't work for everybody, especially the more flinty um, types that are older. Yeah. The only thing I would add is keep it brief, just yeah. based on how many emails reporters get a day. They, you know, you've basically got like one sentence to get your point across. Um, so just keep the, yeah, don't make it a novel because they're just going to go on to the next one. Um, all right, let's go on to next questions. We can get as many of these as possible. Um, this is from Richard Hirsch. Um, we are one of those startups that is a 10 year overnight success. The company got a lot of press when it first launched 10 years ago. So how do we get reporters to see the value of a story that is 10 years old, but is also fresh in certain respects? Anything particular for Richard? Well, I mean, the first question is what's fresh? Yeah. What's, what's different? And if a company has been quiet for 10 years, that tells me quite a lot about their growth rate. Because if they were growing at 200% per year for 10 years, they would be a multi-billion dollar company by now. So something in the growth curve there, thinking about this in a startup perspective, has gone flat. And so if the story is we hit a growth plateau for eight years, changed our business model, and now we've returned to triple digit growth, then huzzah, that's fantastic. But that kind of writes itself. So I'm curious, uh, John and Kelly, what do you think? I would agree. But to your point earlier, um, you have to be able to share those kinds of numbers to a certain degree. And you have to be willing to, you know, if it's not, you know, actual revenue figures, you have to talk about, you know, year over year growth or something like that. Um, without well, knowing anything else yeah. about the story. Yeah. yeah. But but why why go to the press, right? Why, why you, you know, knock on my door and I open it and you're like, hi, here's the thing. And I'm like, oh, is it red or blue? And you're like, I'm not going to tell you. Like, why not <laughs> just share more? No one dies if you share more stuff. And people often tell me like, oh, we don't have to, you know, we're a private company. And yes, that's true. But I also don't have to give a shit. So, you know, I mean, yeah. why are people so reticent to share how they're doing directly instead of just sharing things that are around, you know, oh, we raised venture capital. Great. That tells me a lot about your growth rate. Why not tell me what it is? I think, I think that people find that if they share it once, then, you know, they're going to be asked the question a hundred times. And, and, you know, then if there's a down round or something, you get found out, but I agree with you. I, I think pushing on that stuff, I think like doing anything just because that was the way it was done before, you know, everyone should, mm -hmm. should question that. I think, you know, this whole industry from media to comms is completely different from 10 to 15 years ago and, mm -hmm. and people need to, to adapt. And when, okay. And when I say, or when I see that these people say like they have a fresh, you know, story to tell, like you really gotta, you really gotta dig in on that. Right. Um, fresh does not mean like we do AI too. Right. Um, and, and I always tell clients, especially in the world of AI, like there's ways to tell stories with like, you know, thought leadership and hook into trends and things like that. But there's also ways to sell uh, stories from what, what I call the inside out, right? So, you know, if you're pitching like a, you know, Cade Metz on AI, you know, don't go to him with like, like we have this, you know, broad idea for a product or something like that. You say, hey, there was a paper debuted at NeurIPS last year that we productized for the first time. And this is a little piece of technology that's going to allow our company to do X capitalize on this opportunity like so then you 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 start with the sort of tech cred and then you and then you broaden out and so i think you know there's there's many ways to do it and sometimes comms people just need to be like hey can we talk to the engineers like can we can we just you know really really you know dive in on on what you consider fresh um and maybe tell the story from from there but, um that actually goes to a question from john Schul, who is how do you see AI playing a role in PR media engagement and its evolution? And what are the pros and cons? Because I do think I'm sure Alex, like everyone's throwing AI into everything. Um, also to sort of, you know, have the hook, but yeah. So how, how are you, are you sort of glazed over already? Or like, what is interesting about, about using uh, AI and also just in PR, like are you, is are Kelly and John using it in terms of pitching, creating pitches, et cetera, I guess. Oh, I, ways. Well, one thing I've learned is that everyone hates to write, apparently. Like people just despise writing. And it's like the only 
it's the thing that I like the most. Um, so I, I don't quite get that personally, but I do understand the market demand. So I would be shocked if people didn't use AI to to write pitches and emails and answer emails. And I think now we have technology to have AI write an email for you and summarize one that you receive. So I think this is just literally AI is talking back and forth across the internet now. Uh, but startups, I think, you know, this isn't even the first time we've gone through an AI wave in the last 10 years. I think yeah. we had one back in, John Kelly backed me up, 2018, something like that. If I recall, yeah. recall everyone was slapping AI and everything. Sounds right. And yeah. Back then it was yeah. mostly ML. Certainly the Transformers paper and the rise yeah. of LLMs have made things interesting, but uh, we'll do this again, you know? Um, so to me, I think that the way John discussed the, there's a paper from Neurops and we're commercializing this thing and it's going to change this. That's a really interesting progression because it starts at the, the very foundation of what's new. And if you say academic paper that we're the first to commercialize, I know no one else is doing it. Uh, most of the time though, people are just trying to take some commercially available AI APIs and do neat things with them, but it's not, I, lots of people are doing that. So I think you do have to actually be relatively stand out, but given that everyone's trying to be the same standout in the same crowd, it's hard to be the tallest basketball player. Yeah. Um, all right, I, go ahead, John. Uh, so I, I, I have kind of a hot take on this one. I wrote a blog like, like a few months ago around like how AI is going to change uh, comms and stuff. And, and um, you know, it's actually down to like the value proposition of, of comms and it should be a consideration in, in terms of how you roll out a program. And what I mean by that is uh, if you think about how a neural network works, right? Information is weighted in, in very different ways to produce uh, a, a result, right? So, you know, a social media post from a no-name person about a company weights nothing at all, basically. Um, journalism is the very other side. Journalism, analysts, reports, academic papers, I would say are the highest in terms of non-bias, factual, you know, things like that. And so, um, and, and so like when chat GTP is going to start to like stack rank things, right? What is the difference between this company and this company? Who has a better product between this one and that one? How is the neural network going to pull in that information? How are they going to determine what that is? And I think it's largely going to come down to journalism. And so, you know, there may be a world in which people really cannot afford to, you know, just be doing their own content and things like that because of how results are going to be synthesized. When we move away from the 10 blue links of Google and we start to get stacked ranked search results from AI systems, people are going to make buying decisions on that. And so you need to be thinking about what is the trail of breadcrumbs that we want to leave for these AI systems to produce the right results. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, all right, a couple more. Um, so we touched a bit on non-traditional PR. And so what about podcasts? Currently, someone could safari the podcasting grounds and get publicity and shareable bits along the way. Maybe safari is not the right word, it was a typo. Um, what are your thoughts about these channels? Is there a viable strategy in there or better stick to traditional PR? Alex, what, what type of podcast are we referring to? Because there's like the- because I know, it just says, um, you, you know, non-traditional PR. So just podcasts. Well, there are a, a number of podcasts out there right now. I think Packy McCormick described them as like the tech, uh, someone back me up here, the tech optimist media. Techno optimist. Kind of, yeah. And so there, there's literally a, now a cottage industry of people who are kind of half in the world of journalism and half in the world of boosterism who are technology fans or friends, if you want to call it that, who are doing stuff that does have very, very large reach. And you'll get a... I think a sympathetic hearing. The downside is um, because they're not journalists, there isn't rules against conflicts of interest. So I presume these people are just talking their own book, promoting their own investments and their own friends. Uh, but if you can land one of those, I think that would be a huge win. I just think that it's going to be tough if you don't already have a lever into those spaces or um, the right kind of uh, cap table. Um, this is what I'm sure you get a ton, Alex, but how do we avoid sensational headlines um, that are meant to drive clicks but don't truly reflect the sentiment of the story? TC is less egregious here than other outlets like um, Insider, but it's one of the biggest pain points, in my opinion, of working with the press these days. And you will blame your editor. Am I correct, Alex? 
I mean, up until like 20 minutes ago, I, I ran a team and was the editor. So, I mean, I guess that would be like shooting both my feet at the same time. Um, I So I'll tell you how this works out from my end as, as someone who likes to write. Um, I like to make funny headlines. I like to be whimsical and wry and, and a little bit droll if I can pull it off and try to do some wordplay and just generally be creative. The downside is that if you want people to read your stuff, it has to be essentially consumable either by search or sufficiently interesting on social channels. The thing that I'm surprised by is that given the massive decline in the importance of social media for reaching readers, um, headlines haven't really come down anything in the temperature scale. And so I think it's more publications and editors who have an eye on the bottom line, just being terrified about the economics of our world. And so if you only have one drum, and that's all you can do to drum up your business, then you whack it as hard as you can. So I think this is more a a, a symptom of a greater sickness than it is um, anything malicious or particularly lazy. And the way to avoid a sensational headlines is, I don't know, win a Nobel Prize, and then we'll say that. I don't know. Good tip, good tip. Um, a couple more for you generally. Um, are there any best practices for, this is Brianna, setting up on background intro meetings between clients and journalists? Um, and maybe also John, obviously, and Kelly too. Um, what's your stance on setting up meetings, Alex, with the PR people themselves so they can understand what they're look, what you're looking for and can put the right story ideas in front of you? Oh, I mean, I just nearly never is the answer to that. Um, yeah. I mean, there's already so much work to do the, to have time to schedule and sit with somebody to explain to them the things that I'm currently interested in it seems like such a luxury of an idea that it's it, it's kind of crazy. So for folks who are listening, uh, we have this really beautiful document that we're working off of for this particular panel. And it is the best organized thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, like you would not believe the work that went into creating this session for you. The people behind the scenes, the software, getting us together, the email chains, the text messages, so much work went into this because Bessemer has money and time and 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 the world of media doesn't have those things. So you have to understand that I'm usually scrambling to get my stuff done. Um, so, I mean, the answer to that is I essentially don't do that with anybody. Yeah, all right then. Um, are traditional PR materials useful to you for reporters and editors or backgrounders, FAQs, things like that? Are you, and also Kelly and John, do you produce those anymore? Like sort of how do you prep, I guess, from both sides? But we'll start maybe with John and Kelly on this one and give Alex a break. Um, sure. What are your prep materials these days? Or how do you how do you prep them to talk to Alex? Sorry, are we talking yeah. about providing prep material for the spokesperson? Well, I, 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 it's or good. just spokesperson. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who's talking to an Alex, like, how do you prep these days? What's the best way to prep them? And then Alex is going to respond and sort of what how he what he needs to, to do a good interview. Yeah. yeah. I, I can mean, I can yeah. or, or go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go no, ahead. You, that was no, the politest thing I've ever seen in my life. Look at you too. <laughs> I know. I'm like, We're just going to do this for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, yes, but um, there's two kinds. There's one is generalized media training where you go through the, you know, this the do the basic do's and don'ts, the like how to handle curveball questions, um, or you know how to how to pivot in a not awkward way. Um, and, you know, doing mock interview sessions, like that should always happen at some point, especially for a spokesperson that you're going to be using regularly. Um, but also there's, you know, specific background for each media interview or Q and A or whatever it is, podcast, whatever it is, where you kind of provide background on who it is they're talking to, you know, how did this story, how did this opportunity originate? What are some sample questions that they should be prepared to answer, even if it's just a guess. Um, you know, it gives them some structure to think about it. Um, so that's always helpful. But also, I we also ad advise our spokespeople to think about it. Okay, what are the here's the questions that they might ask? What are the points that you want to make sure get through? Um, and being able to, you know, e even if they don't ask you a leading question that allows you to make these points, like how are you going to find a way to make them? Um, so that's, that's usually at a very high level. That's, that's how we prepare. 
And Alex, what 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 things are like today? Christine did a beautiful job from Bessemer of preparing you. What kinds of things do you like? And you're just like, actually, don't bother. I do my own. I think it would depend on how technical the mm -hmm. the topic is. Um, if we're talking about you know like a software company, I've been talking to SaaS founders for what it feels like six thousand years. So pretty good handle on that. Don't need a lot of hand holding. Um, but if we're going to be discussing something new in like the realm of like AI research, well, you might want to send me some links to read beforehand if I can squeeze it in, because I would like to be able to ask good questions and not spend the entire call going through, you know, relatively basic stuff that doesn't get us to what we're shooting for. So highly situationally dependent, but I've never, I've never bothered by people sending things over because, mm -hmm. you know, if I need it, I have it. And if I don't, then I can just ignore it. Um, so to me, kind of the, more the merrier, all the above is, is perfectly fine. I, I don't want to create extra work for anybody. I want to respect everyone's time. But if you have materials, I, I never hate having them. People often say, you know, the press release is dead and blah, blah, blah. But you know what they're really good for is having the entire list of investors in a round. Yeah. And often founders <laughs> talk very quickly. And yeah. often your recording will have some of them garbled together. So just having that in your back pocket to go check a spelling of a name, for example, is super clutch. So to me, it, it just never hurts to have more information and data, period. Cool. I think we have time for one more, maybe two, if we can squeeze squeeze it in. But um, this one is from Anonymous. Uh, it seems like more and more we're seeing founder-led comms, which is what we've talked about. What tips do you have for companies where the founder is more of an operator and less a person interested in being in the spotlight? I have a particular answer on this, which is too bad. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, you're in this role, you, you know, you have to, this is part of what goes with the job, but we've all seen situations where that's, it's not a strength necessarily. So I'd love any tips and tricks from you guys. Um, maybe John and Kelly, we'll start with you guys. Yeah. I mean, I think in that circumstance, it becomes a bit of a negotiation of like, what, what is it you are willing to do and, and then push them. I also think that you know, I run into a problem or a, a situation a lot where, you know, founders are like, you know, we, we know we need to do it, but I don't love to do it. Right. And the reason they don't love to do it is because they didn't do it right for a long time and they didn't get the results they were looking for. And so like, once you turn that page, it actually becomes like, you know, a positive thing for them and then it's addictive and then they want to do more and more and more of it. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's about trying to get a founder to, to that place. Um, you know, but, but frankly, like, I think it's really tough to take people who are just, you know, plain, not going to invest the time, not going to be dynamic on social and tell them, you know, go do founder led comms. Yeah. As a counter example, have you guys ever met the CEO of GitLab? No. Ah, Sid. Um, not the person who would try out for the leading role in a theater production. You know, and uh, and yet through a lot of training, he's ended up being pretty good at it. Um, after they went public, you could tell that he had gone through not just, you know, media training boot camp, but like, you know, a really long trek to get to the point where he was a very effective communicator. Um, earlier on, though, less so. Uh, the first time I talked to him, he asked if we could record and broadcast our, our interview. So that's on YouTube somewhere if you want to look that up. Uh, but yeah, I think it's something that you can learn. I just think some people are going to have an easier journey there than others. But it's not, it's not, it's not impossible. Charisma is mostly a learned skill, I think. And, and also, going back to the last question around prep, like uh, the prep has evolved a lot over the last ten years, right? Like it's actually now I sort of prep for authenticity. I don't want to turn someone from like a geeky engineer into like Gavin Newsom or something like it just it's just not <laughs> like it's not going to play very well right and so if, like if everyone saw the uh you know the Republican response from Katie Britt after the State of the Union I, like I watched it for two minutes and was like here this is an SNL skit and sure enough it was you know it, it was like no one wants to do that and I guarantee the speech coach for that person, for Katie, was like, we killed that. That was amazing. You know, it was like, it was awful. Nobody wants to be over-rehearsed. Nobody wants to be talked to like that. People want, like, the direct talk, the real stuff, right? And and so, you know, we actually, like, if somebody comes in and is, like, not being themselves, I actually want to go the other way and, and you know, practice, like, not being over-rehearsed. Okay, but John, earlier, Kelly mentioned, you know, how to pivot the conversation, how to make sure that you're getting your points in there. If you don't get a comfortable leading question, how do you, so how do you balance what she is saying 
And also what you just said, because I think it's, it's hard to be authentic yet on script, get not overly stuck to your bullet points, but also making sure to get them across when they're not the direct question. So how do you balance those two sides? No, no, I mean, sorry, I, I don't mean that you, you don't need to know sort of the things that you want to communicate, right? And I, I will tell founders often, like, I don't care if you walk in, the reporter just wants to talk about like your shoes and your car, right? Like they're going to know these five things about, you know, you or your company or your product or whatever, <laughs> but, you know, don't like, you know, be sort of someone you're, you're not, right? Yeah. Sorry, Kelly, I didn't mean to, yeah, just. No, no, this is. No, it's a, it's a fine line and it's a difficult balance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we are a couple minutes over. Um, thank you so much. I really, really deeply appreciate. And thank you so much, everybody who joined us. Um, there's so much to cover and obviously we didn't get to every single question, but we are going to follow up um, and address some outstanding ones in our next Atlas article. So another pitch to please um, join our um, go to market course at Bessemer and follow us. Uh, and we hope to bring this group back together again, maybe for a part two, if they're willing, because it was so, so helpful and useful. So really appreciate your time. Um, but thank you all and have a great rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.